evening, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. That's right, we are actually starting again today in the evening. We are going to Dearly Departed for a party. Yeah, it's going to be that kind of night. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, as you can see, we've made it to Dearly Departed Tours and Museum for our event tonight. But check this out. Famous street artist Meg Zaney left a little art on their wall. How cool is that? So what are we doing here tonight? Tonight is a Rocky Horror Picture Show party. Scott Michaels used to live in London and wrote a book about his experiences and the stories that he read about tracking down the history and the backstories of the production of this play and this movie. He's got a lot of artifacts that were in the movie and tonight he's gonna to talk about his book. Of course, these were from Zsa Zsa Gabor's estate. <laughs> look at this, Welcome. the Mickey Mouse Club, huh? Here we go, look at all this memorabilia. <laughs> this is a part of my collection that I, well, most of the good stuff. I have a lot of paper and things like that, but uh, these are all personal items I have for people involved with the movie uh, directly, actually. Well, this is, this somebody gave me, this is an autograph of Lily St. Cyr, and she was, uh, she designed underwear, and she's mentioned in one of the, uh, one of the uh, songs. But these are the original church and bedroom models from the film. And, uh, and uh, all of these items have to do with the production. This is Peter Hinwood's actual script that he used in the film. The timesheets from the day they did some of the filming. That's a, a, a piece of uh, art that I got from Jonathan Adams, who played Dr. Scott in the movie. So the reason we're doing this is because I wrote this book 20 years ago, and I've never got a chance to tell the story, so I figured I've got the shot me as well. So you're going to hear some stories tonight, see a lot of rare photographs, and uh, I know, it's just going to be a lot of fun. So like he said, these are the original bedroom models from the movie. Check that out, check out the call sheets. All those names, Barry Boswick, Tim Curry. And then there's Scott's book. This should be a pretty interesting night. You are, they started in the West End uh, in London doing theater. They, did, they were all involved with Jesus Christ Superstar, like the very first production, and also Hair. So a lot of those people came directly from that. And also the movie Tommy in 74, a lot of the people that worked on Tommy, uh, including, I, read, I made a list of uh, so many people that worked on the movie Tommy, that went straight from Tommy to, uh, to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And uh, the, there was the set designer, Tim, Tim uh, uh, Ian Whitaker was there, Richard Pointing was the ward, road, wardrobe supervisor, Colin Chilvers who did special effects. And a few of the actors that came straight from Tommy to uh, to Rocky Horse. So they a lot of the people on Rocky um, didn't. I mean, they were really comfortable when they first got there because they knew so many of the people that worked on it. And a lot of the people, especially the Transylvanians, they knew each other from different avenues. There was one organization, an agency called the Ugly Agency, and the Ugly Agency represented people that were all of different shapes and sizes. So uh, the people that didn't know each other in Rocky Horror. Uh, from like the social scene around Kings Road and the punk scene in, in 73 uh, were brought from ugly, like the guy Hugh Cecil who had the monocle, uh, the bald guy had alopecia, Sadie, she was with the ugly agency, she was four foot two, Stephen Calcutt, the guy was like six foot seven and a really skinny guy, Fran Fullenweider, who was literally full and wider. Uh, <laughs> she, was, um, she was brought from the ugly agency too. So, so some people came in not knowing anybody and, uh, and some people knew knew each other quite well. That was They were doing a Christmas show and they needed somebody to write a couple of songs and uh, Kimmy signed Richard up for it to said you should do these because this is you, you're a songwriter you'd be really good at this and he goes what am I going to write about and she threw a book at him of science fiction movies and said you, here's, here's what you love write this and she threw it at him and left because they were they were a little bit annoyed with each other at that point. But that night he wrote Science Fiction Double Feature, which is the theme for the, uh, for the, for the movie and for the play and all sorts of business. When, when it was first opened at the Royal Court upstairs, it was only supposed to be a three-week run, uh, three run. It's a little 60-seat theater. You'll see some pictures of it when I worked there. And, uh, and uh, it takes place, the, movie, the, the play takes place in a dilapidated movie theater. The play was originally supposed to be in a dilapidated movie theater. And the usherette comes at the beginning and she sings science fiction double feature with a little ice cream tray because in Britain that's what they did. They had the ice cream ladies, there's a, there a term for them. 
at the beginning of the movie, they would come up with a tray and they would sell ice creams at the theater. And Pat Quinn was uh, was originally booked for uh, Patricia to play Magenta in the movie. That's her on the left. Uh, was originally booked to do that, and eventually it came into a lips thing. Richard O'Brien and and Jim Sharman, who was the director, were friends, and Richard showed him or played him a couple of these songs, and they brought in Richard Hartley, who was the musical arranger, and uh, and the three of them really hit it off. And they're the ones that decided, the three of them equally, to do this show together at the Royal Court. And it, it never stopped. And the funny, the fun thing about it is that after the three-week run at the Royal Court, they moved it to the Chelsea Cinema, which is just down the road in Kings Road. And it was literally a dilapidated cinema that was falling apart. So it was just, it was just perfect for, for the play. And it was just a, just a magical uh, time. It was just, a, just everything was right there. It was organic and perfect. Everyone was there and everyone signed up. and. And it was just, it was all free flowing and, and it was just perfect the way it worked. When the movie was first released, this was, uh, this was supposed to be the movie poster. This was going to be the sole movie poster. And uh, it's sort of, it's really not indicative of, of, uh, uh, of the play, or the, unless you know, you, you wouldn't know. And it's sort of, a, I don't know, it could be considered off putting to some, especially in 1975 with the guy in fishnets. But then they might not have even known he was a guy at that point, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and that's what sort of prompted him to use the lips at the, for the film, the Man Ray, uh, the Man Ray picture, Lips Over Hollywood. And, uh, and those are the lips that belong to a woman named Lorelei Shark, which is kind of fun because Lorelei Shark was a lip model. She did commercials in the 70s for a lot of uh, radio stations. And for those of you that are older enough to remember Disco Demolition at, at Comiskey Park, uh, Steve Dahl was a popular DJ at the time and he was doing a disco um, revolution and everybody got half price tickets and they brought a disco record to the to the stadium and blew them up. Mm -hmm. I was there throughout the first pitch of the Whites and then turned into a riot, literally a riot and uh, and it became known as Disco Demolition Night. I've got some information about that. But Laurel, I was involved with that. Jaws was really huge. And when they released Rocky, it became a different set of Jaws. <laughs> because it was a spoof of that poster. <laughs> Never knew that. Laurel, I were the lips in the movie for the for the posters, for the still photographs. She was brought in for an hour and, and did this lip model job. And Pat was actually uh, magenta in the movie, and she's the one that played the ice cream girl, as I mentioned, at, at when they first mm -hmm. opened the show at, at the Royal Court Theater. She went up to the front with selling ice creams, and she sang, and it's really baby voice, uh, or kind of a Betty Boopy sort of voice, she sang science fiction double feature. And Pat had a huge cold sore the day that they filmed. <laughs> it was like of all the days. She <laughs> but they brought her in. This is well after the movie was wrapped, and they brought her back to the studio, and they had to paint her with this with this really s s this dark, dark uh, makeup around her lips, but it still didn't work. So what they did was they braced her head, and they put a, a big piece of felt around the camera, so all that, all that would show through were her lips. So when you see that, uh, that was uh, her head was braced and you see it through felt a little tiny hole and I begged my brother to take me to see this movie it was it was uh, I was 15 and it was showing at this theater uh, at midnight and of course it was back it was breaking the curfew laws back then we were literally when I was into it we were, we were hiding in the bushes from the police after the movie was over with because they were uh, they were busting people for curfew violation but I was only 15 when I started going and I never really subscribed to the exact you know, Transylvanian theme. The Transylvanians were my obsession. I always thought of them as sort of like the munchkins from The Wizard of Oz, and I didn't really know how apropos that was at the time. But uh, but we had a bunch of people together, and they used to we used to just go out and have fun. Nowadays, they take it so seriously. You know, they have what they call shadow casts, and you have to audition to be the riffraff tonight. And, and you know, and, and it's it's really kind of exhausting. It's sort of taking the fun out of it because we, when we went, there was like ten people doing riffraff, and you know, it was just a lot of fun. People having a good time, and say people are, I guess, they're taking it very very seriously. The reason I got to meet her is my ex was a talk show host. And uh, before he, he made it on his own as a talk show host, which is really huge, uh, his name's Graham Norton. Before that, he was, he was sitting in for another talk show host uh, by the name of Jack Dougherty. And Graham would come in and fill in a week at a time. And it, it was sort of sad because uh, Graham won like the Best Newcomer Award over Jack Dougherty, who it was his show that he was standing in for. He was, you know, I was really known for trashy TV. 
And uh, they had no guests. They would have anybody on. So Graham says, who do you want to meet? I said, I want to meet Pat Quinn. So they got her in. And I, was, I couldn't even speak. I was so starstruck. <laughs> because, I, I mean, I spent my nights with these people. That's how I, I sort of came to life, which sounds so dramatic. But, but I, you know, I was just, I didn't have any kind of... I didn't have any click. I didn't belong to anything. You know, I went to Rocky. And people were just having a good time in the dark, and it was it was just it was just a lot of fun. It was very well. I've come to realize now it's very Sunset Boulevard <laughs> you know, in a sense. She she's a writer. Maybe you should write my book. So um, so I had many many interviews with her, and I sent out many proposals, but nobody was really interested in in, in her book. But it was by her prompting. That, uh, that I started chasing down everybody else that was in the movie and ultimately the people that were in the play as well. So, and I got to be uh, uh, pretty decent friends with a lot of them. And um, now one of the first people that she hooked me up with, and one of the most important people in this whole story, is Kimmy, Kimmy Wong O'Brien. Kimmy was married to Richard O'Brien. She's the one that sort of kicked him in the ass and started him writing. And she was with uh, he and, uh, and she had Linus with them, and Linus, you know, Linus is a good kid. And Kimmy, she was involved with hair big time. Now in the movie, uh, or in the movie Rocky Horror, she was the Transylvanian. I'm talking like everyone knows this movie, and I know that y'all don't know it as well as I do. But Kimmy had this huge bush of hair, uh, and um, and uh, and she has a couple of really good close-ups in the movie. I'll show you some of those pictures in a little bit. But Kimmy was, was sort of the driving force uh, between a lot of these. And another guy by the name of Perry Bedden, who was also Brian Thompson, who was the set designer's boyfriend, uh, was, was an important part of it as well, but mostly behind the scenes. But some of the really cool pictures I have, I brought a lot of pictures that had never been published before, of this place uh, that Rocky Horror began in, uh, in London. It's a, a very unassuming place, but that's where it all started, which is so cool. Um, now, where the play started was the Royal Court Theatre in, in Sloan Square. Uh, and one end of Sloan Square was the Royal Court, literally the very end of the road. And at the other end of it, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood had a shop called Sex. And, uh, and, they, uh, and they started the whole, well, it was between Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren and, and the other side of Kings Road and Sue Blaine, who designed the costumes for Rocky Horror, that sort of got the whole punk scene going. And, you know, between the two of them, really, and King's Road being the social scene at that time, everybody hung out on, the King, on King's Road. Uh, the Stones lived right off King's Road, and the Beatles hung out on King's Road, and, you know, as I say, Rocky Horror started there, and, and they were over there. The Sex Pistols started. Sid Vicious worked behind the counter at the sex shop. Our book was finally published. I was a bartender down there in the basement at the Royal Court, and the actual play started upstairs there, which was such a, a bizarre situation. Uh, consider, or, or just poetic situation, I guess you could say. One of the things, when, when it was first shown uh, at the Royal Court Theater, there's a gentleman who saw it by the name of Jonathan King. And Jonathan King was a record producer. Bay City Rollers got for Genesis and, and, and produced their first album. And, <coughs> pardon me, Jonathan King uh, produced the first album. And he wanted it to sound exactly <coughs> like it did at the Royal Court at the Upstairs Theater. So they went to the studio called SARM, which is that one on the top left, which is where I, I found that note today. They filmed Do They Know It's Christmas, and uh, Stairway to Heaven, which was, was recorded in that little theater, in that little tiny, uh, which is gone now, that little tiny sound uh, recording studio, and put it down there. And it's interesting to note that all the people that were in the play that ended up in the movie, they only see money from this soundtrack, the original London soundtrack. They don't see a dime from the uh, from the published, you know, 20th Century Fox record. So, uh, so it's kind of funny about that. But when they recorded the the movie version, they they recorded at Olympic Studios there on the right. And after Pink Floyd recorded, and Led Zeppelin recorded there, and the Stones recorded there, and T Rex recorded there. And one of the people that recorded on the album, and I, this is going to be kind of sloppy, but I want you to hear this. And this is Claire. So this lady sings on the Rocky Horror Country, on the Rocky Horror soundtrack. So they brought Rocky to America. They brought it to New York first, and it failed miserably. I think they did like five performances. And it, but Lou Adler, <coughs> Adler, the producer, saw it in. It was his girlfriend at the time was Britt Eklund, the actress. Oh, really? and she saw it at, at the Royal Court. And she told Lou that she should see this, 
and Lou went to see it and decided that they were going to bring it here, so they brought it to the Roxy. Now they jazzed it up completely. They had no sets or anything like that. You know, they had one mic that, that hung down the middle of the stage and when people did solos, they would grab the mic and it was just the same mic that was there for everybody. And, uh, and uh, when they brought it to LA, it was well produced. Because he was a music, he did Mamas and the Papas and, and so many other people uh, back then. So it was, it became the music was the more the focal point rather than the show. But at the original show, they were just improvising. They when they had Brad and Janet driving, and they just said they wanted to make it look like they're they're driving. So they so somebody pretended to be a steering wheel. So he was, and then and then uh, Pat Quinn. She said, "We just sat there and did windshield washers like that, you know, just for the." They were just winging it. Within 18 months of it opening at the Royal Court, it was on screen. It was it was in the can, and um, they, originally they offered a. Yeah! large budget no a small budget this work they wanted Mick Jagger to be to be frank at first really? <laughs> and it was going to be either it go it was either going to be a large budget with a big name or a small budget with a not such a big name but they decided to go uh, sort of pure quote unquote with it except they did hire real Americans uh, to be Brad and Janet originally Janet was, I think, a woman named Belinda Sinclair, and and, Je and Brad was a guy named Chris Malcolm. And Chris Malcolm, as an actor, I mean, he used to be an absolutely fabulous. He played Sappy's father in Abbott, but uh, but he he would he played uh, Brad in the uh, in the play. And by the time they, uh, they they made the movie, they brought in the Americans. He said he was he was offered the role as the guy that gets married at the beginning, who has like two lines, and he just hung up on on them and never spoke to Richard O'Brien again after that for the longest time. When they came to Peter, I think they just wanted somebody that was pretty, really. Uh, uh, Peter Henwood was, uh, and that he certainly fit the bill, but he was never an actor. He was, in, and everyone comments about him being on the set and how nobody, he was clearly uncomfortable. He was the only one on the set that did not know anything about being involved with any kind of production whatsoever. He was just part of the scene back then in King's Road. So did they, did they, all of his stuff? No, no, they, they just never filmed it. Like, no, but I mean, like, oh. after they cast him and then they decided, well, he's pretty, but he can't act, so we'll cut all the rocket stuff? Or I don't think so. they never put it in the film to start? I think Fox just did what they were going to do with it. I think they probably had a lot to do with Blue Adler. Maybe they didn't, they were uncomfortable, they, maybe they were uncomfortable with uh, the relationship between Frank and Rocky. I don't know. I don't know. But they were never shot. And as far as the script goes that Peter sent me, uh, there's nothing more in it than that. And I have I have like the first drafts along with uh, with all with all the notations, and there's nothing in there. I don't think I think they just decided to remove Rocky as a main character. Really, it brought me to life. It really did. Same and, uh, When I pulled up to that mansion the first time, and you see you know those big gargoyles and everything, I, I really I got all choked up. So yeah, it was it was really it was really magical to see it for the first time. And it is a very nice hotel, and I love the fact that there, it is a posh hotel, but they are so cool about Rocky, and they'll let you wander around and take all the pictures you want. Behind Brad and Janet in that photograph, you can see the details of the door right behind them. It is really magical. It really is. It sounds so dramatic to say that, but it's. Uh, to see it and it's still intact. Should not let them use the logo in the movie. Even that was a Fox movie. Yes. <laughs> so that's why they used RKO. And, co and originally, uh, Eddie was uh, frozen in a Coca Cola vending machine, and Coca Cola wouldn't let him use it either. Wow. Uh, so, a uh, so Coke freezer. But that's Sue Blaine on the bottom left, who was soundstage on the right, where the ballroom was filmed when they filmed the time for him. And uh, Bray, uh, I don't know if, it's, if Bray is still there or not. There was a there was talk a few years ago about it being uh, removed and made it to whatever else. But uh, but it was uh, not a huge studio. The top right and left, those are the Griffins that were duplicated from the front of the house when he rang the doorbell. It was just there, and these were all of the Transylvanians. And there were and there were so many so many fascinating people. He did for the Roxy production. No, that was the last of the New York production. But that's a great picture of Tim on the side of the rocks. So you can actually match it up perfectly. And they were okay with that. A lot of people assume that when they see the surgical gown on Frank and the triangle, that that's a nod to the, the Holocaust, the gaze in the Holocaust. And she said the surgeon's gown worked well as a, as a cocktail outfit, didn't it? Um, 
we had a little money so I could afford to go to a hospital and, uh, and buy some old gowns. The pink trial triangle thing was weird because it was already on the gown from the beginning. I didn't put it there. We continued to use it, but it was an accident. It was completely genuine for surgery. It was red, but over the years it was washed out and became pink. It wasn't intentional. It was as if it was some kind of a sick joke. Had I known the significance of the symbol, I never would have used it. Perry in the middle on the right with uh, like Peter Hinwood who played Rocky. I think I was the only person who ever, ever interviewed him. And I only did because I had money. And I say, I've got some pictures for you to sign, I'll give you a thousand pounds, you know. And then I had him so I could talk to him about it. It was supposed to be in black and white turning to color. Really? Mm -hmm. Up until the time it was gonna be in black and white until Tim Curry made his entrance. And when Tim made his entrance, the only thing that was gonna be in color was his lips. And ultimately, it was going to get larger and in color, and that was the way it's going to start. Yeah. And then the Munchkins, you know, the Munchkins come into the scene, which are the Transylvanians. So, it, and there's a few more uh, revelations in there too. Seeing blue skies, you know, where in the in the book in the in the song somewhere with a rainbow, you know, skies are blue. And the bottom right, when he gets down, that's Judy Garland did that in every show. She just she drop her mic and just sit down on the stage and sing. So, uh, so Judy Garland had a huge influence on. Uh, on this movie, and and some of the little snippets in the uh, in the uh, soundtrack do uh, do represent the. You can actually hear bits of the Wizard of Oz in the uh, in the soundtrack. And Richard Hartley, the music guy, uh, completely confirmed it too. It was featured in the Time Warp scene, and uh, and uh, I found the clock too, which is pretty darn cool. Wasn't the clock auctioned off a while? It was. It was bought by the antique house from a magician. And inside of it, well, there's some pictures of it oh. at the at the antique at the prop house. <laughs> but that tag skeleton. on the right that you see, I don't know if you'd be able to read it. And this was in '73 when they first bought it. And it's just the most bizarre item in the city. It was an inlaid mahogany coffin shaped long case clock. Behind the wheel dial is a human skull and skeleton decorated crossbones in ivory. The clock belonged to the Countess of Roslyn, wife of the fifth girl, who was said to have traveled everywhere with it. Rumor is that it was her, the man uh, who was her former lover. No, no, they rented it for the film. All that stuff that you saw in the, the props in the background, like there was that leopard with a snake around it, that was all from this prop house. Brian Thompson picked it all out. I think it was at the last night at the when they clo when they did the Royal Court Theater. Uh, uh, Somebody, I forget where it was exactly. It was a big deal. And Richard did a nod to Tim and didn't get a nod back from Tim as the composer, as the arranger, as the guy that wrote the music. So, you know, and, and Richard was really miffed about it because Richard's the one that wanted to be the rock star. Richard's the one that had the rock and roll voice. Tim Curry wanted to be famous. Tim Curry wanted to be Freddie Mercury. Freddie, because they were good friends. But Freddie, and Freddie had the pipes, but Tim didn't have the pipes. Tim never pushed his voice. Tim had a, a great voice. But he never really pushed it. And Rick, Richard O'Brien could scream it, and and Freddie Mercury did too. You know, pushed the voice to the max. But Tim, Tim never really did that. He didn't have that. So Richard said to Lou Adler, "You backed the wrong horse. You know, you should have backed me because I was the one that had the rock and roll voice, but he had the rock and roll look, and that was part of it." But Richard said something I always use. Uh, he said, um, talked about the movie. He says, "Success always has many fathers." But failure is always an orphan. Look <laughs> behind the wheel. He's actually on a wheelchair. And, uh, <laughs> but, they, uh, but Ken Shepard, he did the motorcycle. And when you look at the movie, it's so obvious that it's not Meatloaf. But he did have an accident, and he went off the uh, went off the side of it and uh, broke his foot during the uh, during the filming. What an amazing amount of information. I'm not a um, historian on Rocky Horror, so I didn't actually know that the theater performance when it first came out was much different than the movie. That was really interesting to find out. And here we see Sadie Corey's outfit from doing the Time Warp. From the movie right here. They said that the reason that, uh, Scott said the reason that she was able to keep this was because she was, I believe they said four foot two. And so she provided her own wardrobe for the movie and they just sewed the uh, those gold buttons on there, the wardrobe department did, but other than that, she got to keep her wardrobe. And now Scott has it. Well, Lionhearts, we're gonna call it a night. I feel pretty much about like Jaw does right now. I am wiped out, but what a cool night, huh? Even if you aren't a huge fan of Rocky Horror, just all the information Scott knows about it, I think that makes it interesting to me. I mean, 
I've seen the movie a handful of times, but hearing all the back detail that he was able to provide was pretty cool. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.